Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles up to the book of Psalms, the Psalm uh, 1 this evening. We looked at the first three uh, verses of uh, Psalm 1 tonight. And uh, to remind ourselves of how we can experience the blessings of God in our life, right? Again, if I were to ask you, if you want God to bless your life, everyone would say, Amen. yes, yes, right? I don't know anybody that, no, 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 thank you. Not really interested in God blessing my life. You know, uh, I'm, I'm good. I've, I've, had, I've had enough. Nobody would say that ever, or at least nobody in their right mind would say something like that. No, we all want God to bless our lives and the lives of the people that we love, right? We're always praying, right? Hopefully we are. Praying for our friends, our, our family members, our you know our loved ones. We pray for our nation, and what we always we're always praying, uh, praying that that God would bless, right? That He would bless, that He would protect, right? Lead, guide, all these different things. We 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 pray these things often, or at least I hope that we do. But what we've learned, or what we should see in God's Word, that is that God's blessings don't happen automatically. They they don't. There there are some things that that we must do. That, that God would bless, right? That, that we have to live a certain way that, that, that would, would uh, have God respond to our lifestyles. The way we live our lives is that that's what God will bless. We, we cannot live in sin. We cannot live in disobedience to God. We, can't not, we cannot mm -hmm. be, uh, be indifferent. We can't be indifferent towards God and God's word and expect for him to bless our lives. It simply doesn't work like that. If we want to experience God's blessings on our lives, there are things that we must do to facilitate God's blessings on our lives. And so what does God's blessings look like on our lives? And now, for everyone that's in this room, you would probably, we could probably give a different answer, right? And, and I'm not saying you're right, I'm not saying you're wrong, that God's blessings manifest themselves in many different ways. Some, some people would just think that the ultimate blessing of God is to have a close-knit family. Right? That, that's it. That's, that, that's the greatest blessing. You want to know what a blessing is? Is that I have a, my family are all around me. We, we eat meals all the time together and just family time. That's, that's the greatest blessing that God could do for me. That's what some people would say. Some would say that, that, that it's long uh, to have a long and healthy, not just a long life, a long and healthy life. Right? Free of any serious sickness or disease. That would be that, that would be a blessed life, that God has blessed you indeed if that's what, uh, what you were to experience. Or maybe for some it's that, that God blessed us because we have career success, or if you're still a student, academic success, right? The, all these are just, just a small fraction of what we tend to think of when we say, well, God is blessing, right? That I have all these things, God is blessing my life. But, but, but see, those are things, are good things, they're good things to strive for in us life, but if we really want to really experience the fullness of God's blessings in our lives, we must strive, uh, strive to live in a way that's, that's, you know, that's centered on God's word, that, that's centered on God's ways for our lives, and, and being obedient to God's ways for our lives. That, that's what's going to lead us to uh, God's blessings, to, to live according to his word instead of the ways of the world. We're warned about this in 1 John, in 1 John 2, uh, 15 and 17. John writes, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. And so here we, we see a, just a snapshot, just a, a, quick, a quick little window into the blessing, the, the, the blessed life, right? It's not, it's not anything that the world has to offer, right? The world is fading away. Everything that you have right now, all the things that you think are so valuable and so precious, everything that you're sweating, right? Pouring out your sweat and, and working so hard to be able to afford that car and that house and to take all these trips and vacations, and right? Or if you're retired, all those things you worked all those years to be able to have all that stuff, it's all going to burn. That's right. It's all going to go away, right? It's not going to last forever. You can't take it with you, right? And so only the things that we send ahead, when we lay up our treasures in heaven, that's what's going to last, Amen. right? That, that's where the real, the real blessings come from in our lives. Biblically speaking, a, a blessed life is a, is a life that is completely yielded to the plans and purposes of God, no matter what the circumstances might be. Because some of us have that 
can't can't distinguish between the two. Sometimes we think if a, you have a, if every if this if someone has a a, a good life, we say a good life, and they're, they're, they don't have any issues. Everyone's healthy. And there's never dra any drama, which I don't know any anybody that has that lifestyle. But I'm just saying we have this imaginary understanding of what that that looks like. Then then there, God's blessing them because look how good they have it. And you look over here to the other family where there's all kind of dysfunction and there's trouble and, and just the sickness, and we say, well, that's not, that's not, that can't, God can't be blessed in that household. Look at all that. What if those those were the exact opposite? What what if that household where all that stuff is going on, the negative things happen? That's where God is blessing, and the opposite is true on the other household. Yeah, sure. It looks like they have everything. Everything is fine. Everything is wonderful. But if they don't no Christ, and they're not following Christ, and that's a train wreck. Right. It's a train wreck. So we have to learn to be able to, to, to divorce those two ideas. The circumstances don't really mean anything in regard to whether God is blessing our lives or not. And God and God's Word must remain the center of our lives for us to continue to experience the blessings of God on our lives. The Apostle John would say that a blessed life is a life that is continually abiding in Christ. In John 15, 4, Jesus said, he said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. See, we cannot truly experience the blessings of God on our lives without first having a personal relationship with God, through believing in His Son, Jesus. That's where it all begins. Right? You, you're, you're not going to be able to experience the, the, the blessings of God, especially the fullness of the blessings of God, unless you have a relationship with with God through His Son, Jesus. Personal relationship with God through Christ is the greatest blessing of all. So let me just pause before we go any further into the text and, and let me just ask you, do you have this? Have you received this blessing? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Because if you don't, then really uh, everything I'm saying, or even up to this point, is not making any sense. Right. It's, not, it's not making sense to you at all because it's contrary, because it's it's contrary to what the world would have you understand. It's that it's contrary to your sinful nature, and that's what has dominion over you right now. It's nonsense. But if you have placed your faith in Jesus, you understand exactly what I'm saying. You understand exactly what I'm saying. But if you haven't trusted Christ, you have you, you may have, right? You may have that close knit family. Right? You may have that great health. You may have financial security and and, and career or academic success, but you're missing out on the greatest blessing of all. You may have all that stuff that we said is so wonderful. That's kind of a, a, a benchmark of being blessed by God. You may have all those things, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have nothing. That's right. You don't have anything. If not, the good news is this. You can have a personal relationship with God tonight. Mm -hmm. Before you leave this place, tonight you can... Fix that. You can receive the greatest blessing that's being offered to you tonight by believing in Jesus. But until you do that, nothing that I say tonight is really going to make any sense. But if you do have a personal relationship with God through Christ, are you willing to do what it takes to experience the blessings of God on your life? Because again, like I said, it's not automatic. There's things that, that we must do, expectations that God has for us, and we're going to see just a a few of those in our text tonight. So if you're able, uh, grab your Bibles now and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word together. Psalm 1, just the first three verses. The writer of Psalm begins, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. This is God's word. Father, we give you thanks for this day that you have made. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the multitude of ways that you bless our lives. Father, your word tells us that, that, that you send your, pain, your rain upon the just and the unjust. But God, tonight, as your people, we want to look at your word and, and, and just that you would teach us and help us to, to, 
to do the things that are necessary for you to continue to bless our lives. Father, we want to be able to, to bring honor and glory to you in everything that we do, everything that we say, every relationship that we have, God. Father, help us to, to live a, a life that you will bless. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I love preaching from the Psalms because they kind of break up into sections that's easy for me to be able to preach to. They almost have their own set of points built in, and so I, it makes it easier for me to be able to process these. And, and tonight I think you'll, you'll see it, especially this, this one, these, these three verses. Um, the first thing that we see in the text is that we need to be uh, separated from the wisdom and the ways of the world to experience the blessings of God on our lives. Right, verse 1 again, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Uh, the, the word blessed here actually is plural right, in the Hebrew. Um, it means blessedness or supreme happiness. And so for us, uh, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, our happiness is ultimately found in and through our relationship with Jesus Christ, not in and through the things of this world, right? It's not. Our faith in Jesus has it not only saved us from hell, it also changed everything about us, or at least it's in the process of changing, right? That whole sanctification thing, that we're, we are made new, but we're, but we're being made new. It's a, it's a process. And how we think and how we behave and how we set our priorities and how we spend our time and, and our money, all those things are, are, are changing, or at least they should be. We turn from our sins to be saved. We, we, we turn from our, our, the sinful things that caused us that needed to be saved in the first place, right? That, at least we should have. Those things that had caused us to disobey God and turn away from God, we should be turning away from those things. That's what it means to repent. Repentance isn't a, a one-time event because we continue to sin after we're saved. Now, while it's true, when we first get saved, there, there is repentance, in justification, right? So there is, a, 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 in that one moment in time, whenever we uh, honestly come before God and repent, ask Him to forgive us of our sins, that is, in fact, uh, it's done. That's one act of repentance. But the Bible goes on to say that we're continue to repent, continue to turn, because if you're like me, I continue to struggle with sin. And then when I continue to struggle with sin, that means I need to continue to repent of my sin. That's right. Continue to repent, continue to ask God to forgive me <coughs> of my sin. And so that's what we'll... We, we know this to be true because the Bible tells us this over and over again. Repentance must become a part of the lifestyle of a follower of Jesus. That following Jesus requires that we die daily to ourselves and to our sinful desires. Surely we cannot think that we can continue to live in disobedience to God and expect for Him to bless our lives. That, that's, that's, that's just insane. It doesn't make any sense that we, we would you know, trick ourselves into thinking that, well, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, look at what, you know, fill in the blank. Look, look at what he's doing. Look at what she's doing. Look at how they're living. And, and, and it seems like God's not doing anything to them, so what's the big deal? Be careful. That's right. Be careful. You don't know what God's doing. Right? That he is a gracious God, but guess what else he is? He's a just God. He's a just God. And, and beyond that, he's a loving God. And it would be unloving for him to continue to let his children play in the street. <laughs> right? <laughs> he will bring about conviction. He will do whatever he needs to do to get his sons and daughters to repent. Are you going to repent the easy way or are you going to repent the hard way? But, but God will bring it about in your life one way or the other. And that's really an act of grace towards us from our Heavenly Father. If we truly want to experience the blessings of God in our lives, we must be willing to separate ourselves, listen to this, from anyone or anything that draws us away from Jesus. We must be willing to separate ourselves from anyone or anything that draws us away from Jesus. You're probably sitting there thinking to yourself, you may have a relationship, you're saying, you, so you mean you want me to separate myself from this person? That's what God's word, that's repentance, separation, yeah, yeah. But what about, I mean, that's my job, Brother Mike. I mean, you you telling me I need to leave this job and find another job? That, that doesn't cause me the, this. I'm not telling you anything. They're just saying what, what God's Word tells us. Right. 
But yes, the, the short answer is just maybe you do need to find a different job or a new line of work if it's causing you to be uh, so, so miserable and, and, and live such an ungodly life. Taking, right, pulling you away from Christ and not making you draw nearer to Christ. Right? Sometimes it's the, the, the hardest part of following Jesus is the part for us to part ways with people. Right? But, but that's my friend. Right? We've been friends forever. And you, I just can't. I just, that's just too hard. I can't, I can't leave that behind. But you see, isn't that what Jesus told the disciples? Right? Sometimes we have to leave relationships. Right? Say, well, hang on, I'll follow you, Jesus, but let me first go and say bye to my family. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't respond to what they said. You, you, you stay with your family. You're not fit. You're not fit to be one of my disciples. And so it's a choice. See, that's what he's doing. He's always giving us choices. Right? If you're going to follow me, then follow me. If you're not, then don't. Then don't. If we want God to bless us, we have to be able to, or be willing to separate ourselves from things that, that draw us away from him. You see, the, the psalmist is warning us to guard ourselves from those negative influences of unbelieving people in our lives. It could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be a neighbor, it could be a co-worker, anyone. Sometimes one of the hardest parts of following Jesus is to part ways with these people. Friends, right? Trusted friends. I, so often I, I'll see on Facebook, you know, and some, some people that are following Jesus or, or, or say they're following Jesus and they're, some of the things that they're commenting on and the comments that they're making or, or, or the advice that they're receiving and who they're receiving it from, it just shocks me. It's like, honestly, what are you doing? I, no wonder, no wonder you're, you're struggling like you are because you keep on listening to this same nonsense. You keep going to the same people, but I'm kind of, I'm getting ahead. As hard as it may be, that's what's required from us to be able to experience the blessing of God. We have to be able to separate. Be willing to separate from anyone or anything that's causing us to be drawn away from Christ. Verse 1 gives us three reasons to separate ourselves from the world, right? From from ungodly people, ungodly influences, right? Because what it is, is we don't, we don't fall into ungodliness overnight. Have you noticed that? It's not just something that you just wake up one day and all of a sudden you're backslidden. It's, 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 it's a gradual process. Notice the progression here in our text. First you walk, then you stand, and the last thing you do is you sit. You sit down when you're comfortable, Right? <laughs> you become comfortable in your disobedience and sin towards God. The first reason that we need to be separated from the world is because believers don't believe like unbelievers do. We don't. We, we don't believe that our minds don't work the same way as unbelievers' minds work. Believers do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, right? And so, again, who, who is it that we're seeking counsel from? I can tell you who we should be seeking counsel from. Not believers at a minimum, but 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 mature believers, right. right? Asking them, he said, you know, you know, would you pray with me about this, right? What in 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 your life have you ever dealt with something like this, and how did you handle it? What 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 have you learned from God's word? How did God lead you to deal with this type of a situation? That's who we should be asking counsel from, not not our not our our buddy from school, from high school. Well, we've been friends for fifty years. Right? He's been lost for 50 years. He's been giving you bad counsel for 50 years. Stop. Stop. Get good counsel from godly friends, godly relationships, mature believers. Some of us are still listening to the counsel of people that have no understanding of the plans and purposes of God. That's what we need, right? What, what, what would God have me do? What would God's word, how would God's word direct me to respond to this situation. Now to be fair, it's not, it's not that unbelievers aren't able to give it good and helpful counsel from time to time on certain things, right? Some things are just, it doesn't matter if they're, if they're a believer or not as far as how, how can you help me fix my busted up car or truck, right? There's some things, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about especially spiritual matters, right? Go to godly people, get godly counsel. The wisdom of unbelievers is limited because it's darkened and distorted by their unregenerate hearts and minds. 
Lost people tend to counsel the same way that lost people think. All right? Lost people tend to counsel, give counsel in the same way that they, they think, the way their minds process. Their counsel is always going to be carnal and, and worldly. Their counsel is always going to be man-centered and not God-centered. Why? Because they can't. They don't know. They don't have the mind of Christ. They, they, they can't give you uh, God's understanding of any certain matter because they don't have a relationship with God. They just don't know. Ungodly people give ungodly counsel. And guess what? God will not bless that. That's Amen? Right. He won't. He won't bless that. The second reason that we need to be separated from the world is because believers don't behave like unbelievers. Now, <laughs> sometimes we do. Far too often we do, right? That, that's part of the reason that we're called hypocrites so often and rightly deserved. Believers do not stand in the path of sinners. When we get saved, we're made new in every way. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We have a new heart. We have a new way of thinking. And we, we, and we will have a new glorified body when Christ returns. And that's really exciting. That's, right. that's really exciting because, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of in the middle there age-wise. And I'm already, sometimes I get up out of my chair and my, I don't know. I don't want it. My back won't let me stand up straight, and my feet hurt, and all these other things. And I'm I'm already looking forward to that that body where it don't it don't hurt, right? I, where I don't wake up and I wake up in the morning and get out of bed and I'm sore. What did I do? I just slept, right? I'm looking forward to this glorified body. But right now we have a new heart. We have a new way of thinking, and how we behave is what sets us apart from those that do not know Christ, isn't it? Our, our, our visible witness, uh, how we talk to people, the language that we use, uh, how, we, how we treat people. Are we kind? Are we gracious? Or are we mean? Are we disrespectful? Right? People take notice of those things, especially nowadays. Right? If, if, if you show compassion and you show grace and you say please and you say thank you, people are going to take notice of that because it's rare. Right? That's how we're the salt. That's how we're the light, by, by, by the way that we treat people, by the way that we, we behave. Our godly behavior is what makes us the salt in life that we're called to be. Our changed behavior is evidence that we have been saved, right? Why should a, a believer still be doing the same simple things that he or she was doing before God saved them, right? right? It, it, it was wrong, right? It's sinful, it's wicked. It's wrong. Why, why would we still be doing those things? Why would we go right back to the slop like a pig, right? Or as the Bible says, like a dog to its own vomit. You say, well, Mike, that's disgusting. Mm. Good. So is sin. That's right. That's the point. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Now, to be clear, we'll still struggle with sin. All of us do. Sanctification is that process. It's a painfully slow process. I, 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 I wish that the moment we all got saved, we were just perfected, right? I, that, that everything was like just downloaded. They could just like, like plug us in with a USB cord, and, and we'd know all of Scripture, and, and everything about us would be changed, right? That we have, we'd be just be, be perfect, be glorified instantaneously, but that's not how God has designed things to work. But struggling with sin and, and willfully participating in sin with unbelievers are, are two different things. Our behavior should be uh, influencing the lost, not the other way around. That's right. right? We, we should be influencing them, not the other way around. But that's what typically happens. Lost people will behave like lost people behave. And saved people should behave like saved people should behave. How do we know what we're supposed to act like and behave like? God's Word tells us. And if you're not sure, what would Jesus do? Behave like Him. Right, as best we can. Well, how would Jesus respond to this type of situation? If I was Jesus, what would Jesus do in this moment? Do that. Do that, do that as best you can. You, you won't go wrong. When we, when we behave like lost people, we, we tend to forfeit God's blessings on our lives. We can either have our sin or we can have God's blessings. But guess what? We cannot have both. That's right. Can't have both. Either we can... We can we can receive what God has for us, the blessings of God in our lives, or we can have
have that sinful desire. One or the other. You can't have both. It doesn't work that way. The third reason that we need to be separated from the world is because believers don't belong with unbelievers. Right, that, that last little section there says, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I think one of the clearest passages that speaks to this is 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15, where Paul says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness, righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Some texts in the Bible were difficult. They're unclear. This is not one. <laughs> right? This isn't one of them. Right? It, it, it even, even lays out some scenarios here and, and gives us some a rationale of, of why. The scornful here are those that make light of God's law and make fun of all that the Bible holds as sacred. Boy, we're seeing a lot of that today, aren't we? That's right. Right? Making light of and, and making jokes. All the stuff that's going on now with the federal courts and all the new discussion on Roe versus Wade and all these protests and whatnot, the things that are coming out of people's mouths are disgusting. Right? They're, they're mocking. They're making fun of what the Bible holds sacred. They're even going to the sacred places. They're showing up at churches and doing all these things. Scornful. That's what the, the psalmist was talking about. Those individuals. Scornful individuals. This is the final stage of that gradual progression away from godliness for a believer. That backslid the state. Warren Wiersbe puts it like this. He says, when laughing at holy things and disobeying holy laws become entertainment, then people have reached a new low level indeed. Right. We're there. That's right. We see it every day. <laughs> we were, we're almost to the point that surely it can't get worse than this. Surely that we've reached bottom. I, I, I haven't seen anything this bad. And then tomorrow happens. Right? We're going to separate ourselves from this nonsense. This individual no longer offended. Right? Believers will, will get this same way that they, they're, they're sitting there. The, the psalmist is describing a believer that has become comfortable among those that reject and mock God, right? They sit down. These are my friends. These are my people. No, they're not your people. Right. God's people are your people. You're saved, right? That's your family. But this is my family. No, God's family is your family. Your forever family is your family. That's your people. That's where you should be spending your time with them. But, 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 but what? Either we believe God's word or we don't. Get to a point where you're no longer offended at their mockings, at the things that they say. When they begin to say things that are contrary to God's word, you don't even blink anymore. You just kind of just kind of shrug your shoulders and go along with, yeah, well, you know, I, I understand your point of view, and I respect it. You know, no, no biggie. Might even get to a point where you participate to some extent, join in the conversations, right? Let me just ask you, who do you feel the most comfortable around? Right? <laughs> Who are your people? And I might be stepping on some toes because I might be some talking to some of you that are just the same way. Well, you know, I just feel more comfortable around them. I don't really feel comfortable around church people. Mm. What? You don't feel you don't feel comfortable around God's people, and you're and you're supposed to be one of God's people, and you don't feel comfortable around God's people. Let's back up. Remember that repent. <laughs> That's right. You might need to repent. No, you don't might need to repent. You do need to repent. You need to repent if that's your mindset. Where do you feel like you belong? You should feel like you belong among, amongst God's people. That's, right. that's where you should feel like you belong. Believers should feel the most comfortable around other believers. Believers should feel that, like they belong when they're with other believers. Because the church is a forever family. Right. Right, if, you, if you can't feel like you belong here or feel like you belong amongst this group of God's people, maybe you need to find another group of God's people. Maybe you can be feel, feel like you belong there. 
but honestly, <laughs> I don't think you'll feel comfortable there either because that's a cop out. No matter where you're going to go, you're still going to have that same excuse. Why well, just don't feel comfortable around them, those people, around God's people? Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. Believers are strangers and pilgrims in this world. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says the world is not our home. Amen. We're just passing through. We're just passing through. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we can either belong to the world or we can belong to Jesus, but we can't do both. We can't try to belong to both and expect God to bless our lives because we do that too, don't we? That's the struggle. That's that tension that we live in where we're, we're trying to, to live in a way that's pleasing to God and yet that flesh, that sinful uh, nature that still exists within us is, is always warring against that righteous nature. But we can't do both. We can't do both. We, we can't live in a way that's worldly and expect for God to bless our lives. So how do we, you know, how do we separate ourselves from the world by not walking with the ungodly or standing with sinners or sitting with the scornful? That's what the psalmist would tell us. That's how. As believers, to experience the blessings of God, we must be separated from the world. The second thing that we see in the text is that we need to be saturated with the Word of God to experience the blessings of God on our lives. Verse 2 again says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Instead of seeking counsel from the ungodly, as God's people, we must seek our counsel from the Word of God. Amen. All right? The Word of God. We must saturate our hearts and minds with the Word of God. Saturate. We know what that means, right? When it rains a lot, what happens to the ground? saturates right saturated with rain and with with water right that's that we know and so for us we spend time with god and his word not not just hurriedly not not just kind of getting it done so we can say we're done with our reading for the day but but to actually slowly methodically think about what we're reading and then pray about what what, what we're reading right meditate as we're going to see in a, in a moment to saturate our hearts and minds with god's word in the commentary I used this this, this week, the, the, the author said this. He says, if we speak to the Lord about the Word, the Word will speak to us about the Lord. Amen. How awesome is that? It's true, right? <laughs> the, the, the Word of God will speak to us about Jesus. The Psalms are speaking of a believer that loves God and loves His Word. And in fact, verse 2 makes it clear that, that, that we should delight in the Word of God. And now again, church is a place of honesty. If, if we were all asked, if we say, what do we delight in? Um, the, reading the Bible probably isn't in, again, our top ten list. We'll, we'll, Miss Jen would say bluebell ice cream, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Junior would say running dogs, hearing them dogs, yapping, and this, that, and the other. He takes delight in that, right, don't you? Right? And enjoys it. But, but for most of us, we're, you know, we're, again, being honest, we don't think about, you know, we're not saying we, we hate the Bible or anything like that, but we're just, you know, when I think of things I delight in, it may not be sitting down and reading God's Word. Shame on us. That's right. Shame on us. We should be asking God to give us a desire. Make, make your Word something that we delight in. Because if we delight in God's Word, we're going to want to spend time doing it, right? Spending time in God's Word, if, if it is our delight. But as believers, hearing, reading, and studying the Word of God should be something that we truly enjoy doing. Whatever we find our delight in, we are certain to make it a priority. Whether that be time with our spouses or our family, whether it be our favorite hobbies or our sports, or most important of all, reading and studying the Word of God, right? What, what do we delight in? <coughs> The Word of God isn't just a book of fables or myths and legends. The Word of God is God's revelation of Himself to us. How do we know who God is? How can we know how to know God? 
How can we know what God is like? How can we know what God uh, wants for, uh, for us? What's his plans and purposes for us? All these things, you, you're not going to find it anywhere else but in God's Word. The Word of God is God's revelation of Himself to us. The Bible doesn't just contain God's Word. The Bible is God's Word. Amen. We couldn't know God in a saving way without the Word of God. Do, do we, sometimes we, I think we forget that. That we get so enamored with creation and the beauty of creation, and we should. We, we get, God reveals Himself in creation. Amen? We all get that in the beauty of nature. But, but we can't understand that we're sinners and we need to be reconciled to God by staring at trees. All right, we're not going to look at a, at a beautiful sunset and say, I need to repent. We need God's Word, special revelation. God needs to reveal Himself in a saving way through His Word. And it's a blessing, and we should take the light in God's Word for this reason. We couldn't know God in a saving way without His Word. We certainly wouldn't know how to live in a way that's pleasing to Him without Him giving us His Word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everything that we need to know is in God's Word. That's right. Everything, every, every work, every good work that he, he wants us to do, has for us to do, we can find out how to accomplish that through His Word. That we saturate our hearts and minds with the Word of God by meditating on God's Word continually, right? The psalmist says, day and night. Day and night. How, how do we do that? How, how do we saturate our, our minds through meditating on God's Word? Well, let me just say it this way. It doesn't mean that we have to have our face in our Bibles 24 hours a day. That's simply not practical. Because we do have other things. We do have other responsibilities. Some of us have... You know, uh, job still to, to attend to. Well, let me back up. If you're retired, you still have jobs. Yes? Let me so before, before y'all burn me with y'all's eyes, y'all say, no. y'all say, I don't work. I work. I work harder now than I did when I had a job. I just don't get paid. Right? I'm in your head, ain't I right? <laughs> right? But we have things to do, right? We, we, uh, we understand that. So we, we can't just sit there like a monk staring at the Bible all day long. That's not, that's not the intent. And I think it means that we're to be purposeful with our time. Be purposeful to give thought to what we have been reading and studying with throughout the day, right? Maybe it was that, that morning reading. Maybe you do have a Bible reading plan and, and this is what you dealt with. Maybe just, just purposely letting that bounce around in your head and, and thinking about how you can apply that truth in different ways, right? That's what it kind of means to, to, to meditate on God's Word, to, to marinate in God's Word, if you will. And we do this all day long, right, until we go to sleep at night. That we wake up in the morning with, with, with the Word of God uh, on our minds. And maybe, as I've shared, that's a good time. I, I used to, for years, I just say, well, I'm not a morning per person, and you know, I'm, just, I'm not going to do that, but God has convinced me otherwise. He said, that's what I do. Used to get up in the morning and do other things and get up and start messing with my phone or whatever, checking emails and get on social media. No, nope, not anymore. Right, he, he showed me. The first thing I do is open up my Bible app and I, where are we at and do my reading and stuff like that. Man, it's made a difference. Right? It's made a difference in how I start off my day. Now, we've been through the Old Testament and been in Kings and it's been pretty rough. And, you know, it's been a blessing, but it's been one of those things where like, oh, my, what, what, and, and another, another wicked king. Shocker, right? And this one did, did evil in the sight, right, of, of, of God once again, over and over again. But still, starting out your day with God's Word, that, that's a blessing, right? To, to meditate upon God's Word and, and just continue to think about God's Word all throughout the day. That's what this means, to continue to fill our hearts, fill our minds with God's Word. It means that we're to be memorizing God's Word, right? Hiding it in our hearts, right? Psalm 119, verses 10, 10, and 12, 10 through 12. Within my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. You see, we cannot meditate on the word of God if we do not know the word of God. That's right. <laughs> you, you can't think upon, you can't meditate on, you can't marinate in scripture that you have not read or, or laid your eyes upon. Spend time with God in that passage. 
The Word of God is more precious to us than we know. The Word of God is our food, right? It nourishes us and strengthens us. The, the Word of God is our light. It, it, it guides us. It gives guidance to our lives. It, it, the, it's our truth, right? It purifies us. It's, the, it's our living water, right? It refreshes us when we need refreshing. I think about the, the, the account in Luke's Gospel whenever uh, Jesus has been raised uh, from the dead, resurrected from the dead, you know, and, and on the road to Emmaus, y'all know the account, and those disciples are walking along, and woe is me, and kicking rocks, and this, everything's miserable, and uh, and Jesus kind of just shows up, starts walking with them, and it's like, what's, what's, what's your guys' problem? Why, why the sad faces? You know, like, you didn't know what's going on, and they're like, you know, who, who are you, and don't you know what's going on? And in any way, Jesus begins to, to open up God's word to them and, and walk them through the text. And, and they were astounded at what they, they had heard. And in Luke 24, 32, I love this. It says, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? You see, it wasn't just that, that it was Jesus there with them sharing the, God's word. It was the scripture, right? That, that, that their hearts burned as God's Word was being revealed to them. See, when we delight in God's Word, we will saturate our hearts and minds with the Word of God. To saturate our hearts and minds with the Word of God, we must meditate on it continually, day and night. So, well, Brother Mike, how, you know, how can I do that? You know, I, I want to do that. Ask God to help you. Right? Every, you got to find out what works for you. I had to find out what works for me, and every one of us the same way. We're all different. Whatever you need to do, do it. Like whatever, 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 however, whatever you need to cut out of your life or, or rearrange your schedule where you can spend more time with God's Word, do it. Do it. You won't regret it, I promise you. As believers, to experience the blessings of God, we must be saturated with the Word of God. And the third and final thing that we see in the text is the result of being separated from the world and saturated with the Word of God. We'll be strengthened. By the word of God. Strengthened by the word of God. Verse 3 says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Uh, the, the Bible uses lots of imagery, and oftentimes a tree represents a kingdom or an individual. Uh, the psalmist used the imagery of a tree uh, that has been planted by a river to represent the blessings of God on the life of an obedient follower of Jesus, right? An obedient follower of Jesus. That's, that's an important detail. Someone that has separated himself or herself from ungodly influences. Someone that has saturated himself or herself with the Word of God. They not only know what the Word of God says, they do what the Word of God says. James 1, 22 to 25. James says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? That kind of sounds like, sounds like uh, Psalm 1, verse 3. It's very similar, a, a similar outcome. This tree represents strength in the life of a believer, I believe, in four ways. Firstly, the tree, re re the tree represents prominence. Prominence. Like a large, healthy tree, the, the blessed life stands out at, and is unmistakable among the lost and other lukewarm Christians. Right? Prominence. Secondly, the tree represents position. Position. Like the river nourishes the tree, the blessed life is nourished by the living water of God's Word. Thirdly, the tree represents productivity. Productivity. Like the tree brings forth its fruit, the blessed life brings forth spiritual fruit. Right? <clears throat> how, how do we know that we're Spending time with God and His Word, applying it to our lives, fruit, <laughs> right? It'll begin to, to produce fruit, good spiritual fruit. 
And fourth and lastly, the tree represents permanence. Permanence, like the leaves of the, the like the leaves of the tree never wither. The blessed life is produ uh, life produces works that have eternal significance. Eternal significance. The last line in verse three tells us that whatever we do shall prosper. Whatever we do shall prosper. And you're, you may be saying, what do you mean? What do you mean? It says whatever. God's word says, whatever we do shall prosper. Now, I, I, I think it's important for us to, you know, to think of it this way. That this is limited to whatever we do according to and align with God's word for our lives. Again, you can't, you can't do something that's against God's will and expect for it to prosper. Right? That's what he's talking about here. That, that if we separate ourselves from, from uh, things of this world and we, and we saturate our, our, our hearts and minds with God's word, the, the things that we're going to seek in our lives to do and accomplish are going to be things that God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. And we will prosper. A blessed life is a life that is prospering spiritually, not just materially. The blessed life has nothing to do with health or wealth and everything to do with knowing and doing the will of God for our lives. Amen? That's what the blessed life is really all about. That's what it's all about. And so tonight as we wrap up our time together, I would just ask you, to, as thinking about things now, looking at your life through this type of filter, would you be willing to say that God is blessing your life right now? Because you probably say yes. Right? Because you, you, you were mixed up before. Maybe you were thinking that, that, that God's blessing on your life is continued upon circumstances, and if I have all this and all these needs are met, and then God's blessing my life. But that's not always the case, is it? Right? This is what being blessed is about. As we saw in our past tonight, being blessed by God doesn't just happen because we want it to happen. It's going to take effort and commitment on our part. It takes us being separated from the world and saturated with the Word of God. We don't believe like unbelievers do. We don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We don't behave like unbelievers do. We don't, we, we don't stand in the path of sinners. We don't belong with unbelievers. We don't sit in the seat of the scorn. We must delight in the Word of God. We must meditate continually upon the Word of God. That's how we'll do this. That's how we will live a, a life that God is sure to bless, that we'll prosper in all that we do. If we do what the Word of God says, we'll receive what the Word of God promises to us. That's what the Word of God is in many ways, is it not? A book of promises, a book of assurances that we have. The Word of God just promised that we would be blessed and that whatever we do shall prosper if we're willing to be separated from the world and saturated with the Word of God. Right? That's the promise. Good old smiling Joe Osteen is wrong. Believe it or not. Mm. Ronnie, I hope he's not on <laughs> that station that you listen to. No, not at all. <laughs> you see, you can't have your best life now. But you can have a blessed life now. Mm. If we apply these truths to our lives. Amen? That's right. All right. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this day that you have made. God, we thank you for passages like this that can be hard for us to accept because they can uh, be hard for us to receive. So God, I pray that you would help us to uh, always seek to live in a way that's pleasing to you. Father, I, I pray that you would help each one of us, and we're all in different situations and have different relationships, God, but Father, I, I know because your word tells us that, that you want us to live in a way that's pleasing to you, that you want to bless us. You want to bless our lives, but God, you will not bless us if we continue to live in disobedience. You will not bless us if, unless we separate ourselves from, from individuals, from people, from situations and that, that are drawing us away from your son Jesus. 
that are contrary uh, to us growing in our knowledge and understanding of who you are. So, Father, I pray that you help us. Give us the resolve to, 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 to make some changes in our lives. Some, and some are hard. I'm not, we know that. These are difficult decisions to make, but with, with your help and with your leadership, God, we know that all things are possible. So, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters tonight. God, I do pray your blessings upon everyone in this room. God, I pray your blessings upon those who can't be here with us tonight. We have so many that are struggling with physical uh, health issues. And, it, and it's some that just can't be here for a number of other reasons. God, I pray that you would just bless them, that you would encourage them in their circumstances, help them to, to, to know that they are loved, uh, that they are thought of, and uh, that they are missed. So Father, I ask that you would just continue to, to be patient with us as we continue to uh, want to be everything that you want us to be. God, we ask that you would strengthen us, that you would continue to instruct us as we spend time with you uh, in your word, and then to help us not just to understand your word but help us to do what your word says I thank you once again for this time we've been given tonight we love you and we ask these things in jesus name amen